Hey folks, my name is Olivia Turner, and this is back with the Oklahoma State University Archives Live. Today I'm joined with David Peters, the head archivist for the OSU Library. David, how are you doing today? Uh, much better than last week. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty bad last week. Pretty, pretty bad chilly. storms. Pretty cold. So we are currently filming today in Old Central, one of Oklahoma State's oldest and most important buildings. As OSU continues to grow, so does the need for new buildings buildings for classrooms, residential life, or even just student hangouts. And David, you actually specialize in buildings around campus, is that right? I've been studying the, the campus for over 35 years now. It's really one of my interests, so I enjoy it. Awesome. And I'm gonna tell you guys, you guys are gonna wanna stick around for the end of this episode because we have quite a bit of really cool photos to show you from OSU's earliest days. It's really cool, I will say. Um, but until then, we're just gonna hop right into some questions. Okay. The first question is, what is the style of buildings on campus? So currently, uh, the style is known as the Modified Georgian. Uh, this came about in about 1928 when uh, Henry Bennett came to town and became our president at that time. And uh, over a period of years, he developed a, a series of plans for development of campus. Uh, and he used Phil Wilbur, who was the architecture department, uh, to create this style, this Modified Georgian style. Um, Initially, before 1928, it was an eclectic style. The buildings varied from building to building. Uh, but Bennett wanted to create some real symmetry and, and uh, substance uh, and a similar style for all, all buildings. So from 1928 on, we've, we've had a modified Georgian style. It's become a little more modernized uh, more recently, uh, but that's the style of, of that core group of buildings in the Central Campus. So cool. A lot of our viewers know that Old Central is the first official building on campus, but how did that come to be? So when Stillwater was vying for the college to be brought here, they had to provide 80 acres of land and funds to develop a building. They had to create funds for a building. It was easy for them to come up with the 80 acres. Uh, the, this town had just been settled a few years before, and so they had four uh, farmers uh, and their spouses, but they were willing to uh, donate or provide 40 acres each, so that's 200 acres. Actually, one gave 80, so that's, that's how they got the 200. Um, but the town had to come up with the money uh, for the building. And so what they did is, it's, it was so new, they thought, well, they'll just have uh, bonds. They'd issue bonds. Well, the first set of bonds that they issued, the courts threw those out. They said there weren't enough people in Stillwater to support the, the payment of those bonds. In the meantime, uh, the, the territorial structure changed. It had been Republican, but a Democrat had been uh, elected president, and so he replaced many of the territorial officials with Democrats, and it kind of threw everything into a, a little bit of a, a delay. Um, but eventually, the city was able to raise enough bond money to support the construction. Uh, the territorial legislature came in with additional funds, and they, they supported the, the, the central building at the, at the time. It was, it was the own, only permanent, considered permanent building on campus. Interesting, I did not know that. Um, how did the university decide to construct a new, like new buildings for the campus. So how does the university really decide when to do that? Well, sometimes it's based on need. Initially, it was definitely based on need because there was, there was no facilities on campus and they were using churches and businesses in town and, and other places where they could have students gather. And so churches were very popular for early on. But initially, uh, the Agriculture Experiment Station covered most of that 200 acres. And so they needed a chemistry lab, they needed a barn, they needed a horticulture building. Uh, and they also wanted to have a, a home for the president. And so those were the first four kind of temporary wood frame buildings that were constructed before Old Central came up. Uh, but over time, um, you know, as, as they've assessed the need, then they, they provide facilities for that when the, uh, the revenue streams are available for them to do that. But it can be a challenge sometimes, uh, and sometimes we've needed facilities sooner than we got them, and so we've had periods of overcrowding. Um, but we've adapted, uh, and, and so we're, we're pretty good at, at that. So. I always love adaptation. Yep. <laughs> okay, so if you are just now tuning in, this is the Oklahoma State University Archives Live. This month we are talking about the buildings that has made this campus such a great one. <sighs> Sorry, I needed a breath real quick. <laughs> but what I want to know is, what is your guys' favorite place on campus? Is it your, was it your dorm? Was it the library? Or even just the student union? While you guys are commenting below, David is going to show us some of the photos that he has. All right, so um, we'll see what we have here. So this is an image of what was the first Lewis Field. The field went north and south, uh, and there was a, a covered stadium uh, on the west side. And so this shows the covered stadium uh, by Lewis Field. 
and I, think, I don't know if you can see, but most of the gentlemen are, are cadets, just like the uh, Texas A&M cadets. We had cadets here also, and so they're attending a football game uh, at Lewis Field. Then, uh, about 1920, 21, um, roughly, Lewis Field was then moved going east and west, roughly where the location of Boone Pickens Stadium is now. Uh, and so this is simply looking across uh, at the field, um, and there's, there's not much there. Uh, so. uh, and the reason it was moved going east and west is because the uh, gymnasium building, which is completed about 1920-21, uh, went in where part of the old Lewis Field was located. And so they had to, they had to reconfigure the, the football uh, field at that time. Uh, so this is the gymnasium. It's now where the School of Architecture is located. This is also the building where Bedlam first happened. Uh, Bedlam wrestling matches. Uh, we had wrestled OU, uh, and I guess it was very loud. <laughs> but uh, they would set up a, a wrestling mat uh, on the basket over the basketball floor, uh, and so that's where Bedlam first occurred uh, in this building here. But this was a gymnasium, uh, and this is inside of the gymnasium. Uh, so now it's completely different because Architectural has taken it over, but. Uh, uh, you know, they got studio and other things in there, but this so is the gymnasium. Um, and uh, uh, there was a track that ran around uh, the, the, the upper level uh, of the stadium so people could jog or walk up there. Uh, it was also a popular seating location. Um, they had bleachers they could pull out, but people also enjoyed sitting up there. And sometimes it was so full that people would actually climb up into the rafters and, and watch from, from the rafters. And it had a swimming pool uh, on the east end, in the east little section. Uh, there was the first indoor pool on campus, and so uh, uh, it was a very popular location. Um, and then this is uh, years later now. Um, here is uh, Lewis Field at the time, uh, with the stadium has both north and south stands. Uh, they're currently working on um, uh, the uh, area for for writers, uh, the press box uh, on the east. Uh, I'm sorry, in the south, south stands. And that's, that's old Gallagher Hall. Um, it was completed about 1939, um, and that's where the new Gallagher was built on top of that Gallagher. And so you can see that still the relationship between Gallagher Hall and Lewis Field, and now it's uh, Gallagher and, and Boone Pickens Stadium. Uh, this was uh, the second barn uh, built on campus. It's roughly where that parking lot is between Whitehurst and Willard Hall. Uh, and had uh, ramps, you could actually drive uh, vehicles and livestock up to the second level too, uh, not just the first level, but it was a multi-level facility uh, and they uh, kept uh, almost everything there. Uh, it was quite a, quite a barn. Uh, it was destroyed by fire about 1921. Here's the beef cattle barn. Um, it was built on the site of the old dairy barn. It's along farm road and the building on the right is the meat lab. <coughs> This is Bennett Chapel, um, and it was built on the site of where the, presi the second president's house was located. This is uh, the bookstore and shop building, but it was mostly a bookstore. The front section and the, and the bottom layer was built from recycled stone from the first power plant. Here's an early picture of campus, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, from about uh, 1905, 1904. The street in the front would be Washington Street. It doesn't go through anymore, but it used to. From right to left, you have uh, Williams Hall, Old Central Engineering Building, and the Science Building. This is uh, about 1902, a few years earlier. Uh, once again, uh, from the south side of campus looking north, Williams Hall on the right. Uh, the first college barn is a little barn back behind uh, between uh, Williams and Old Central. And then you had the construction of engineering and, and then the science building. Uh, I just love this shot. Uh, they had everyone, faculty, student, and staff show up, uh, and they had them spell out OAMC. Uh, this is on the lawn, uh, just, just right beside Old Central, uh, and they're looking uh, out, and, and the camera did over a 90 degree turn, but so you have Morrill Hall um, on the left. Uh, it's now the Gardner uh, Art Studio, but it was uh, uh, the domestic science building, the old auditorium, and then the last part of the Prairie Playhouse, which is an earlier auditorium. Here we have Cordell Hall, which is no longer with us. It's, it was at uh, uh, Residence Hall just east of Boone Pickens Stadium. This is the interior of Cordell. Uh, they were, you know, when they started building these larger residence halls, they wanted uh, the students to feel like they had like a living room, like home. You know, they could go to so they could get out of their smaller room and have a place to socialize and, and gather. So 
that's just a, one of the lounges in Cordell Hall. Uh, this is the first dairy building. This was uh, completed by 1904, um, and it was located roughly where, um, well, the, the northeast corner of the Student Union is now. There's a loading uh, dock uh, now that's kind of hidden, uh, but that's where the dairy uh, building, first dairy building was completed. This is the inside of the dairy building, and this is where they began uh, making milk and cheese and ice cream and butter, um, and they would continue that on in later buildings, but uh, interesting little building. This is the, the second thin dairy building. It was completed in 1928. Uh, it was the one that was recently removed, well, recently, a few years ago, but for the uh, Bellman uh, building, went where the old dairy building was. This is an interior shot of the second power plant, uh, and so the university for quite a while uh, generated its own power, um, and uh, so it was, uh, this is the engineering part of the power plant. This is Gunderson Hall. It was also known as, originally known as the engineering building. This is, it's under construction about 1911. And then there were some earlier uh, shops uh, between kind of where Gunderson Hall is and, um, uh, well, the power plant, the earlier power plant. Um, but there were shops, uh, there was metal shops, electric shops, um, there were wood shops, um, and so the students could actually practice doing these things. Uh, most of the engineers uh, had lots of hands-on activities and they would occur in those shops. Uh, this is the uh, uh, fire station. Um, so it was a cooperative effort, not only with the college, um, but with the city and the state and the federal government. And so uh, they had multiple revenue streams, uh, but we'd had a series of fires early on in the college's history and they felt it was important to have a fire station on campus. And so that's why it's located uh, right at that corner of uh, Knobloch uh, and University. So, uh, this is just a picture uh, looking towards the Williams Hall. Uh, this is right in front of where the, the fire station is now, but there were gates. And so at most of the locations going into campus early on, especially on the, on the east and south sides, which were most developed, uh, there were gates. Now they, they never officially opened or closed them, but they had uh, these gates, which they had. Here's, here's another example. This was on Hester Street. Uh, another set of gates entering in campus. And we do have that again now on Monroe. If you come in from the south of campus on Monroe, there's kind of these large uh, pillars you know, on both sides and that kind of represents the same, same thing that you're entering campus. And then uh, this is Hanner Hall. It's uh, no longer with us. Uh, it's where the new Spears School um, building went in, but it was a residence hall for men um, built in the 1926. This is our first stock pavilion. And so agriculture was also very important, and they needed an arena in which uh, uh, students could display their, their livestock and, and hold uh, judging contests. And so this is our first stock pavilion. It was located roughly where the, the Mass Science Building is um, today. This is inside of the second stock pavilion. This is the arena area uh, inside the second pavilion. And this is what they called the Little International. Uh, they would, um, there was an international livestock judging uh, that occurred elsewhere. Uh, but they would have students practice at what they called the Little International uh, in the uh, arena here. And this is that building. This is the Animal Husbandry and Livestock Pavilion. The back part is the pavilion part uh, for livestock judging and shows, and the front part they had laboratories and classrooms and offices for animal husbandry, animal science now. Uh, and this was located roughly where the new, um, part of it's where the Noble Research Center is, but then also part of it is where the, the new um, Ferguson uh, agriculture uh, building will be going in. So, uh, this is Morrill Hall. Um, every land grant college should have a Morrill Hall. Uh, we'll talk more about that maybe, but this is, uh, it, it was the last building completed during the territorial period. And so, from the territorial period, we only have two buildings left Old Central and then Morrill Hall, completed in 1906. Uh, this is our second power plant. It's located where the classroom building is now. Uh, and so, uh, and with the construction of this power plant, they began really expanding the tunnels around campus to, to get the energy and, and water and everything distributed. So that's the second power plant. Uh, this is the second president's home. Uh, this is where Bennett Chapel is now. Uh, and it was named, uh, well, it was, it was just called the president's house uh, when they, um, and Bennett was the president who lived there the longest. And so when they built Bennett Chapel, that was in part a dedication to him, but also to our service men and women. Uh, but it was at that site, and they, just, they called it Bennett Chapel for them, for Mr. and Mrs. Bennett, both Dr. and Mrs. Bennett. But this was their house. And they had a, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a garage on the left side, and then above that was a sleeping porch. They had no air conditioning, but it, was, it had screens all around on three sides. And so in the evenings, 
uh, with trees and a breeze. <laughs> you, could, you could survive the summers, but they, that was a sleeping area. Uh, this was our first science building, um, and it's located kind of roughly, well, roughly where um, the Paul Miller building is now, just a little, bit, a little bit off from that, but it was our first science building, completed about 1898, 1899. Uh, I don't know if you've never noticed, but you know, there's not many trees. In fact, there's hardly, there's no trees. Um, and so the campus has, has changed a lot landscape-wise, too, over the years. So this is that first, uh, that first auditorium, uh, and it was more or less gutted, and then has been refurbished as the Serotine Center. And so uh, Williams Hall sat in this front area, and, and it was torn down in the late 1960s in preparation for the expansion of the auditorium and the Serotine Center. So that's a, that's a reuse of a, a part of a building in addition to it. Uh, especially after World War II, we had a number of temporary buildings come up, and so uh, there's Quonset Hut sprang up all over campus. This would be between what is Morrill Hall and, and the architecture building now. There's a parking lot there now, but at one point it was just filled with Quonset huts. Here's an example. This is what it looked like inside. This was a Quonset hut that was used by the library as a study area for students um, after, World War I, after World War II. Sorry, after World War II. So there's a large study area. Uh, this is Thatcher Hall. Uh, it's along uh, Knobloch, uh, and it's still there. Um, I'm not sure how much longer, but uh, it was the women's dormitory that was the complement to Hanner Hall. Uh, from, from the front side, they were mirror images of each other. This did have a little smaller area on, on the east side that served as a reception area for, for people to gather. This is Theta Pond, <laughs> not many trees in that picture. Uh, this is also about 1902 or so. Uh, and in the background, you can see just the few buildings that are on campus, but there was not much here uh, in 1902, and so it took a while for the campus to develop. Uh, this is Willard Hall looking out on um, uh, Theta Pond. I just lo I love this picture of the reflection of, of Willard Hall, which was a residence hall for women uh, for a long period of time. And now it's been refurbished and being used by the, uh, used to be the College of Education. Now it's a part of the College of Education in Human Sciences. So uh, uh, these were rooms. Uh, this was a, a, a little kind of a medical room uh, for women in the first women's uh, residence hall. Uh, it's now the Bartlett Center for the Studio Arts. Uh, but they had a room there. Uh, and this was the Y hut, uh, the YMCA hut uh, was a very popular hangout. This is before the student union came along. And so students, if they needed a place to eat on campus, the Y hut was a place they could go. And it, I think it operated beginning in the, in the 1930s, late 1930s. Uh, it sat roughly where the classroom building is now. Uh, so right across from where the student union ended up being. Uh, but you could get uh, snacks and, and hamburgers and, and uh, but Y hut, it was, and that Y comes from YMCA, the YMCA and YWCA. Uh, kind of ran this, the Y hut. I think that's all we've got of those, so. You know, <clears throat> if I have to say anything, if any of our viewers are as big of a sports fan as I am, that photo of Lewis Field was by far the coolest picture I think I've ever seen in the OSU archives. Such a cool photo. But we're gonna continue on with our questions. How are the buildings named? So, early on, they were named by location, so like the central building, <laughs> Old Central, uh, and so it was by its location, but very quickly became known by their, um, their specialty, what, whatever they were there to service. And so the auditorium was the auditorium. Uh, the engineering building was for engineering. Uh, uh, the buildings were named by their purpose. Uh, and so if you had uh, chemistry and stuff, if that was a predominant activity in that building, it was the chemistry building. If it was more general science, then it would be known as the science building. And so they were simply named by their function or purpose. Um, a little of that happened, well, the first building to actually be named for someone was Morrill Hall, be named for Justin Morrill, who was a former senator of Vermont, who was very instrumental in uh, the development of the land-grant uh, system uh, of colleges, uh, so we provide education for the masses of people, uh, have public education. So, but, but very few buildings were named for people except for Morrill Hall. Um, in fact, I think the first building that was named for someone was Whitehurst Hall, and, and uh, John Whitehurst was the former uh, head of the um, uh, State Board of Agriculture, which, served, which was our regents at the time. And so I think that's the first building named for a, a person um, in Oklahoma related to this, this college. Um, uh, but you know, for a long time after that, you had you know, um, uh, Life Sciences uh, East was the biology building, uh, Engineering South, Engineering, Engineering North, 
uh, physical sciences. You know, a lot of buildings are still, were still named uh, for a long time by their function, uh, math sciences, life sciences west. Uh, the infirmary was where the hospital was located. And so, you know, they were simply named by their function, uh, which made it easy to keep track of what was going on <laughs> in those particular buildings. Um, but those, those naming decisions still had to be approved by the board. Um, and so as we swift, uh, shifted from the State Board of Agriculture to our own regions, you know, names, suggestions would still be brought to the regions. And so now that we're beginning to name facilities after individuals more, you know, they will review those suggestions from the administration uh, and then I think they're the final, uh, they make the final decision uh, on whether a building is named for a particular individual. Awesome. Have there been any buildings that has been reconstructed? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let me back up a little bit. So we've had buildings, so like the early, many of those early frame, wood frame buildings that were moved. And so they wouldn't tear them down, they would simply move them to a new location. Um, and then there have been some buildings uh, that have been kind of repurposed. So maybe it was originally built for um, uh, engineering, but then later on it was used as a library annex. Uh, and so we've had buildings that have been re repurposed for a new function. But like the, the science building from uh, 1918, 1919, uh, that building was refurbished uh, and changed quite dramatically. And now it's the Paul Miller Journalism Broadcasting Building. And so they put a new front on that building. And so if, you, if everyone has a chance to go on campus, but the brick on the front matches the, the what's called the OSU blend of the uh, Georgian modified architecture. But the rest of the back part of the building, the west portion of the building, is an old brick that doesn't fall into that Georgia modified architecture and doesn't have the, the OSU blend of brick. And, and so it was, it was repurposed, um, you know, and so we, we've done that a lot. Um, you know, in the past, uh, we, we just really didn't like to tear down buildings we didn't have to. Uh, and so uh, the auditorium is a perfect example of a building that was more or less gutted and refurbished and additions were put uh, in place to, to expand the kinds of things they could do with the Serotine Center. Awesome. Are there any buildings that are on campus that are abandoned? I'm sorry, currently abandoned. Well, so uh, like Kurt Drummond uh, right now, I, I don't believe there's anyone in there. Um, and so there are times where uh, buildings have, have not been used. Old Central was not used for a while. It had been condemned. And so they had to clear everybody out. Uh, and then it took them a while for to get funding to kind of refurbish the building to, to enhance the structure a little bit and make it, make it usable again. Um, generally, though, we, we, kind of, we kind of wear buildings out if we can. I mean, we just use them. Uh, and, and maintenance has, has been an issue. Oftentimes we don't get the funding support we need to maintain facilities like we should have. Other times it's, it's um, construction issues. Uh, Williams Hall, when it was built, they hadn't really uh, planned on the, the expansion and contraction of clay soils like they should have. And so the foundation caused them trouble from, from the very beginning. So that was a learning experience. We had you know, some things that we just didn't prepare for well enough because we weren't aware of the environment we were, we were moving into. And so uh, buildings have been, um, um, abandoned. Uh, sometimes they're brought back up into shape and then, and then some buildings have been, have been torn down. So, but then even some of the buildings that have been torn down, we've reused uh, that first power plant, we reused that stone in another building. Uh, so we've been pretty frugal. So you kind of touched on how we tried not to tear down buildings if we didn't have to, if we could, we could repurpose them. But how does the university decide a building is no longer needed? Uh, you, safety is an issue, so it, it may be needed, but if it's not safe, you know, and then you have to determine, is it worth the investment in trying to salvage the building, or if not, you know, we'll tear it down. Um, then uh, is it worth the investment in, in remodeling the building uh, and, and convert it to another, another function? Um, and if that isn't true, you know, it reaches a point where the building, or if, if a newer facility um, that just uh, is, has more priority uh, and is really uh, more critical to the strategic planning of the institution, an older facility at that location, you know, may be torn down. And so there's a variety of reasons uh, um, that we do that, uh, and we try to avoid that when possible. But then, uh, you know, Hanner Hall uh, had really kind of outlived its purpose, um, and uh, the Spear School was working on, you know, a fairly significant uh, change uh, in their facilities, trying to bring all of their um, various departments and faculty together in one, at one location. Uh, and, and so the, the, the answer was a, a new, whole new facility uh, and it just happened to occur where, where Hanner Hall used to be, so. Awesome. I wish I was still around when buildings like Williams Hall was still here, 
because it's really interesting to look at a building and think about the students that have roamed its halls or sat in its classrooms. However, that doesn't mean I don't utilize the buildings we still have on campus to its full extent. I always spend my time in the student union, whether it's cranking out homework or eating lunch with my friends, I'm always having a great time there. Also, fun fact, I reached high status last spring because I went to Chick-fil-A and the employee remembered my order without me having to say anything. I walked up, she even remembered my name because her name was also Olivia. So I felt pretty good. I also have my own unofficial official study spot. Um, nobody quite knows that yet, but I do. And so I 100% believe that the student union is in my top three favorite buildings. But what I want to know from the audience is, where do you spend most of your time on campus? Or if you're no longer in Stillwater for the time being, where did you spend most of your time on campus? Make sure to comment that below. Also, if you have any questions about OSU in general, make sure to comment that as well. We always love to hear what you have to say. While you all do that, we're gonna go into some questions that people have already started asking. Cassie wants to know, what do you know about Morrill Hall? So, uh, Morrill Hall was completed in 1906. Um, there was a challenge to it being completed. We had already begun the process of moving from the territorial period to the statehood period, and there was a, a kind of a cease and desist order for all new construction because Guthrie was concerned that they might steal the, the territorial capital, which was in Guthrie, and move it to Oklahoma City. And so if they had no building in Oklahoma City, they couldn't move the capital. And so it was really uh, Guthrie politicians who said, there should be no more construction uh, until we get to statehood. Well, I didn't stop the capital eventually moving to Oklahoma City anyway, but Morrill Hall happened to fall in that same time period. And it actually took university officials going to the U.S. Senate and getting the Senate and Congress to approve kind of a, uh, an exemption uh, to that restriction on construction. So Morrill Hall, uh, when it was built, uh, it was our, our main administration building. Uh, and so it, it uh, um, the second floor is where most of the administrative offices were located. It had a huge safe on, on the second floor. Um, the challenge was Morrill Hall was destroyed with a fire uh, in 19, August of 1914. The building just was gutted. Um, and there was even talk about moving the college elsewhere because, I mean, that's where, that's where the college, <laughs> most of the functions were located. Um, but we, we got past that, but we have very few records for that period before 1914. So the first roughly 25 years in the archives, we have few records because Morrill Hall burned. Anyway, um, used administration building, used for agriculture. Over the years, it's been uh, transitioned to other activities. Uh, and now it's the home for uh, education, the Department of Education. So uh, it's had quite a, quite a career and, and uh, it's quite a building. Um, and I think it's probably our most significant early building. Awesome. William wants to know, when was the original Spears business building built? What is the remaining portion of it used for now? So um, that building was typically known as the business building, uh, and it was built in the 60s, I think about 65, 66, 67, sometime in, in the mid-60s. Um, so that's why it was built uh, for the College of Business. Um, and uh, after it uh, was no longer needed for, for the college, uh, for the School of Business, the Spears School, uh, what they did is, I think in, they weren't really quite sure what to do with it, but there's been so many construction projects on campus that in the meantime, other departments have moved their, their faculty and staff and, and graduate students into that building temporarily while they engaged in construction elsewhere. And so uh, I know engineering is getting ready to do a major project with Engineering South, um, and so I'm not sure, but they may be moving some of their people over to the old, old business building. I think it's simply now called the um, General Administration Building or some as a kind of a very generic name uh, because I think it will continue to be used as a kind of a, a, a place where uh, overflow uh, or temporary uh, uh, offices are needed uh, for departments that are in transition because of construction elsewhere. Awesome. So you kind of touched on it earlier about how buildings were named after their core functions, so like the chemistry building. Um, we have specific classes now in buildings as well. So for example, journalism majors and strategic, communi strategic communications majors use the Paul Miller Journalism Building. Mm -hmm. Has it just always been like that? Generally speaking, I think it has. Um, you know, as soon as an engineering building would be completed, then, you know, engineering would focus on activities there. Now, certain departments may be in the mechanical engineering building and others may be in the civil engineering building and some may be, you know, in a shops building. But uh, generally speaking, for larger units, uh, like in engineering, uh, they would oftentimes 
you know, occupy a whole space um, or a whole building. Uh, smaller departments, you know, as they develop over time, uh, kind of seed, seed departments that are just beginning, uh, oftentimes would share facilities. Uh, and so we've had also, especially in, in the arts and sciences, um, it's, it's been quite common in the past for a number of departments to share a facility. Um, but even like mathematical sciences, the, the math uh, building, uh, I know at one time, you know, history and, and political science were in that building along with mathematics and statistics. And so buildings have also been shared uh, by a number of different departments. Uh, generally, all in one college, um, but that, that's, that's varied over time too. Um, so, um, but usually a facility is designed for a certain purpose and then those departments will move into that building and, and occupy it. Awesome. I will say, I've had a couple classes in some random buildings. I had my first journalism class in Ag Hall, which I think, I think that's kind of cool though because it kind of gets you used to campus, but that, that is... Well, I'm, and agricultural communications is a, is a very strong area, exactly. and so I can see how having a, an activity in Ag Hall for that. Ag Hall was a nice building, I will say. Um, within the first 50 years of OAMC's establishment, which buildings would you say were the most popular? So buildings, I would say the auditorium, which is where uh, the, the, the main large hall of the Serotine Center is now. It was very popular, you know, for concerts and, and recitals and performances and, and, you know, varsity review and all, all of the activities that, that would occur uh, oftentimes had a tie to uh, the auditorium. Um, of course, the, the gymnasium uh, for uh, wrestling and basketball and, and other sports uh, that occurred indoors. Uh, plus classes that would occur, um, you know, it used to be you had to have a physical education requirement and so everyone had to have a class in, in, in PE um, and so uh, that was also very popular. And of course then uh, the various athletic, other athletic facilities, mostly Lewis Field and, and Gallagher Hall were very popular facilities uh, for a number of people uh, through the years. I'm trying to think of other things. The first 50 years is before the student union so um, it hadn't made its, made its presence known then. Um, and of course then Old Central. You know, m I think most students hopefully have had a chance to at least walk through Old Central. Uh, and there's still activities with the Honors College here. Uh, and it's just a popular location. You know, sometimes it's just the spot, not, not necessarily a facility, but the location of Theta Pond is a popular location uh, for a lot of people on campus. Uh, and this part of campus, this older uh, s uh, southeast corner, is a popular location for people to, to kind of hang out. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, where can people go to learn more about the buildings? So uh, the Centennial History Series was over what, tw roughly 25 volumes that were completed uh, golly, a long time ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, but there's a book exclusively on the campus and campus development. Uh, so there's a lot they can find out in that book. Plus the other books too. If you're interested in engineering facilities, you can look at the engineering book. Ag facilities, you can look at the agriculture book. Uh, so th that whole series has a lot of information about facilities on campus. And then we did a book, uh, oh, this is close to 10 or 15 years ago, but the campus of OEMC. And so if you're interested in, in buildings, facilities uh, before 1956 uh, on campus, so the early years, um, uh, that's, that's a good resource. Um, uh, we've done a number of uh, articles in State Magazine over the years uh, and, and its predecessor, the Alumni Magazine, OSU Alumni Magazine, oftentimes featured facilities because they're trying to reach uh, you know, an audience outside of campus too and so they're, they're highlighting new, new facilities and, and uh, new construction. And so you can find out a lot in that. And, and, then, and then the old newspapers, those are available online too, the digital uh, services that we provide through the library. Uh, you, can, you can search old newspapers. And if you have a particular building in mind, you can do a search and see where it pops up in articles. So awesome. there's quite a few sources. Awesome. David, you were so awesome in helping us get to know this campus a little bit more today. Is there anything else you wanted to include before we sign off for the evening? I do think it's interesting to think of the spaces too between the buildings, how those have changed over time. You know, this area around Old Central is now filled with trees, but at one time this was uh, an area where, where military practiced their marching. Uh, well, you don't do it with a lot of tree trunks in the way. And so, you know, spaces have changed over time, and I think you know, we need to look at the, at the landscaping developments that have, that have occurred over time, too. And especially recently, we, we've done a, a great deal uh, with uh, Steve Dobbs and his crew to really uh, accentuate uh, the, the areas between the facilities and, and making the movement between buildings better and, um, and the interaction between, um, you know, uh, people who walk and bike and, and, and cars, just that there's a whole balance that has to occur. And I, th I think sometimes it's not just the facilities themselves, but how we migrate between those that are interesting. So 
people, when you're walking around, just kind of look about, look about and see what you can find and, and see what you can discover. There's a lot of fascinating things on our campus. I definitely will do that. You know, I will never pass up the opportunity to learn more about the buildings that have made this campus so great, mainly because it has built such strong students. David, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. As promised, here is a beautiful photo montage of some great pictures of campus back in the older days. Go Pokes!
went tumbling down, pledging their love to the ground. Lonely but free I'll be found, drifting along with a tumbling tumbleweed. Cares of the past are behind, no. Crossing the Great Divide, the cross-eyed 